and let us all that we can to build a better future. So Glenn Greenwald had an exclusive sit-down interview with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Now, there are, to be fair here, some things in which I agreed uh, with RFK and things I have to commend him on, on how he changed his mind on Russiagate, um, his stance more or less maybe on Ukraine war, um, how he is willing to pardon Snowden and Assange, which is interesting. I'll play that commentary video. Um, and then, of course, the back and forth conversation of Roger Waters um, or, or the, the back and forth of Glenn Greenwald speaking about Roger Waters and deleting the tweet. So, um, again, some things are going to be interesting to bring up. Other things, not so much. I, again, look, I'm not going to tell anyone how to vote, especially when it comes down to this convention or how this primary is going to play out, especially for Democratic voters. Um, I'm ex not expecting much from anyone running in the Democratic Party, be it Marianne Williamson, RFK Jr., definitely not Biden. And now there's rumors of um, even uh, Gavin Newsom even throwing his hat in the ring. So potentially running a shadow campaign. Um, if you vote Democrat, know this. Chances are the nominee has already been picked. If it's not going to be Biden, it's going to be somebody else. And there's this really lame attempt to try and push up Kamala Harris as well, because let's face it, and let's be clear here, Joe Biden is going to be the oldest sitting president in U.S. history should he be reelected. And a vote for Biden is more or less a vote for Kamala. Now, I want to get back on hand with the conversation of RFK Jr. and Glenn Greenwald. And these are a couple of highlights from the interview. And it's up to all of you, the viewing audience, to decide how you want to vote. I understand we have some supporters of RFK Jr. who are part of our uh, audience. And for that, you know, everyone has to come down to their own conclusion. But again, if you vote Democrat or Republican, you as a voter do not have a seat at the table. With that being said, let's check out this first video. And it has to deal with uh, RFK Jr. changing his mind on Russiagate. About your candidacy and doing so in a largely positive way, but alluded to the fact that there were some differences I had with you. you mentioned the fact that you seem to me to be a kind of vehement supporter of Russiagate. Your campaign contacted me, said they thought that was an unfair characterization. I went back and looked and concluded that at least it was excessive. And I went on the air a couple days later and kind of withdrew that characterization and said, there's no need for me to kind of try and describe his views because he's going to be here and I can ask him. So here you are. In terms of this Russiagate narrative that really dominated our politics for five or six years, and the two prongs of it were that the Trump campaign collaborated with the Kremlin to hack into the DNC emails and uh, manipulate the outcome of the 2016 election. And the subsidiary claim was that Trump was some sort of a puppet of Vladimir Putin or controlled by the Kremlin due to blackmail and other leverage. What is your view now about the veracity of those two claims? Well, I, I think that there was a period, which you're correct about, uh, that I... Um, that I just accepted the mainstream narrative. And, you know, part of that is just my own fault of not being skeptical about it. And part of it also may have been just my natal, you know, uh, bias against Donald Trump, which I, I'm, you know, I was like most Democrats, I was probably just happy to hear anything uh, that, you know, um, that, that confirmed my own notion of, of, uh, of Donald Trump. The, the first time that I, I um, had any kind of inkling that there was that that narrative may not be complete or accurate was when I was having dinner with Oliver Stone. And Oliver Stone lives about a half mile from where I live. And he had Cheryl and I for dinner one night and uh, with his son, Sean, who, um, you know, who's a, who's a podcaster and a political critic and it's the two of them, I, I don't know how it came up, but, you know, maybe one of us, Cheryl, I mentioned it, but um, 
but he scoffed in a way that was very dismissive and uh, and then had a sort of a brief dialogue about um, a brief monologue about how uh, there was nothing to that story. And it seemed to me, you know, and you, of course, you're, you're with Oliver Stone. So you think, well, here, he's a guy who's embracing fringe theories anyway. And, you know, you never you just don't know. But it, it put the first seed of doubt into my head. Now, again, hearing this, obviously, yes, everyone probably had their own bias. Everyone had their own perspective of Donald Trump ascending to the presidency in 2016. That is to be expected. We all know uh, many people who immediately got Trump derangement syndrome and were happy to hear anything to explain the reason why Hillary Clinton lost. Um, the real reason why Hillary Clinton lost was because she was an unpopular candidate and voters were not impressed with her. She was uh, the bottom of the barrel. And let's face it, the DNC worked with the Hillary Clinton campaign to deny Bernie Sanders the nomination. And of course, Bernie Sanders being the cuck that he was chose to not fight back at all. Now, obviously, we know the truth about Russiagate. It's a conspiracy. Not only just with the Durham report, but hell, the Mueller report. Remember Mueller time on TYT? I know. Cringe times indeed. But the truth is, is that the media created a narrative that fooled millions upon millions of Americans. And unfortunately, there are plenty of Americans, no matter where they stand in the socioeconomic ladder in this neoliberal nightmare that we call America, that still believe that narrative. Hey, YouTube, you ever going to hold MSNBC or CNN accountable for the lie that they peddled? Is Max Blumenthal the only person in uh, the media outlet circle that's actually going to ever confront these jagoffs that actually lied and could continue, and continue to perpetuate that lie? Let's continue on. And then uh, in 2020, when people started criticizing, including myself, uh, the, the methodology that was being used to prove the COVID vaccines, I all of a sudden started seeing these propaganda tropes or these tropes that were appearing all the time saying anybody who criticizes vaccines is probably a Russian bot uh -huh, or a uh -huh. Russian student. Uh -huh. so, so then I think, oh, okay, so here's what they're doing. And, uh, and it, you know, it may be orchestrated. And then as the, uh, as the, you know, I, I think at that point I was open to hearing a different story. And then I started seeing the piles of evidence. And but I still was neutral on it. I mean, in my mind, the jury was out on this stuff uh, until I saw, you know, the, the recent disclosures, the Durham report, et cetera, that showed that, all, you know, that it makes it look like the entire thing was fabricated from a whole cloth. And again, that's the truth. So I have to tip my hat and say at least, OK, fine. You had dinner with your rich friends. You spoke to. Uh, you know, Oliver Stone and you start you started looking into the facts yourself and came out to realize that, OK, maybe you've been lied to. Maybe it was all one big conspiracy. And for that, I know people that eventually have come to terms with realizing that Russiagate and all this Trump derangement syndrome was manufactured by the media. Sometimes there's a lot of people who just believe the facts, and that's how powerful corporate media is. When I say that it successfully brainwashed people into believing the neoliberal narratives, this is a prime example of it. So can't hate them too much on it. You came to your own conclusion. But, folks, there's going to be other videos that will make you say, OK, I'm not participating in the Democratic primary at all, or I'm not going to be engaged in electoral politics either. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I focused on it so much was not necessarily because I thought it was an unfair and un and baseless conspiracy theory that was being propagated by the U.S. security state and the corporate media, which I do think it was. I thought the much more important implication was it was essentially making it so that it was virtually criminalized, inherently so, for American officials to talk to Russian officials. Michael Flynn almost went to prison for calling the Russian ambassador to talk about U.S.-Russian relations. People were petrified of having conversations with Russians because of fear that it would be used to suggest they were sort of on the, a Kremlin loyalist or a traitor. 
when I look now at the kind of fervor, the anti-Russian fervor that's driving the war in Ukraine, to me, a lot of it seems to have come from this kind of anti-Russian sentiment that Democrats in particular were encouraged to feed on for all these years as part of Russia Gate, going back to 2016 when they blamed Russia rather than the Democratic Party and Hillary Clinton for her defeat. I'm wondering if that's something that concerns you, this idea that so many Americans are being taught to view the Russians kind of the way we looked at them in the Cold War as this grave existential threat to the United States, and that in part is what is driving what you described as this bellicose mindset toward, toward Moscow. We've seen all the posts on social media, be it Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube, especially with this war in Ukraine. <clears throat> let's, let's be clear here. This war could have been avoided. At any point in time, this war could have been avoided. This war could have been avoided. But because of the media and the narrative of Russiagate, this ridiculous conflict was allowed to happen and has continued to escalate even to this day. And already there's talks about even more aid packages, which is downright despicable when I'm having to wonder, well, gee, When's the American people going to get a relief package? I think we're overdue for one for quite some time. No. You're, you're the, the answer to your question is yes. I, I you know, I, I now I see in some way the Ukraine war that I see a lot of those, you know, that the the Russian propaganda tropes that we were being. Uh, that we were being force fed through the mainstream media and always, you know, with the, the source to a U.S. intelligence agent, an unnamed U.S. intelligence agency, which is always suspect. Uh, and usually coming out of the Washington Post and the New York Times, which, you know, have these deep relation, almost mockingbird like relationships with the U.S. intelligence agencies. And now I see that as kind of the runway to the uh, to the Ukraine war, that it, that it was all, you know, that we were being uh, propagandized to see the Russians as an existential enemy. And again, I have to commend him for changing his mind and also giving his thoughts on this ridiculous war in Ukraine. However, uh, with that, I do want to uh, bring up this other video as well with his thoughts on Ukraine and how the United States provoked it or provoked war with Russia. Or let me rephrase it again. How through this proxy war, Russia was provoked to invade Ukraine. Let's play this video. Ask you about Ukraine, just uh, one more question, which is I've heard you before criticize President Biden the way a lot of people have, that it seems very striking. There's no effort, seemingly, to try and end this war diplomatically. If anything, there seems to be an attempt on the United States to block diplomatic efforts to end this war. Uh, do you think it would have been possible to diplomatically avert the war beforehand or to end it now? And if so, how would you do that? Yeah, I, I think it can be ended immediately. I, you know, to me, it seems... To which I have to challenge RFK Jr. and say, all right, you want to end it immediately. Even Donald Trump says he can end it in one day from that infamous CNN town hall. Um, okay, that's an idealistic perspective. However, you have to take into account of the many war profiteers that are in both the Democratic and Republican parties. And, of course, the investment from corporate media there has to be an overall conclusion if again this war continues to go on especially into the 2024 election cycle which chances are it probably will because again there are many people that are making a huge financial killing including your fantastic lawmakers in the u.s senate and house yes they are doing insider trading and yes they are profiting off of war that's what our lawmakers do they take money from their donors but they also do insider trading as well they don't have your you know, concerns at the top of their head. Like I said before, these politicians, they don't like you. They don't think about you. They don't respect you. And to which I have to say to RFK Jr., okay, you are indicating an end to the conflict. How are you effectively going to pull that off when the military industrial complex pulls the strings in Washington, D.C.? Senator Dick Durbin has quoted about the banks. They run this place, but so do other lobby groups and huge, huge financial powers that profit off of war. It's clear that Putin did not want this war, that he didn't, you know, that 
I, I mean, even in, you know, when the Donbass voted 90 to 10 to, to join Russia, Putin didn't want them. Putin said, no, you stay in Ukraine. And then, you know, he was part of the proposal of the Minsk Accords, which would have left Donbass part of Ukraine and, uh, you know, an autonomous region so that they could protect their, their cit- the Russian ethnic citizens who were then being murdered by the Azov Battalion and by the, the Ukrainian government. And that they could continue to practice their own language and culture. And, um, but that, you know, I think that's the basis for a, a peace agreement. And the, the key part of the Minsk Accords was that NATO would not go into, would agree permanently, we are not going into the Ukraine, which is an understandable request from Russia, who has been invaded three times through the Ukraine. The last time in 1940, uh, 40, 41, or 41, um, one out of every seven Russians was killed. Now, again, uh, this is a historical fact. Russia does fear another invasion. I mean, it is something that is engraved, I think, in many nations' mindset. That's the fear of invasion, and Russia knows it firsthand. Uh, the aftermath of World War II even still resonates in this modern day and age. Um, and the thing is, you have many people that continue on to play this game of warfare. Now, the only difference between what was going on in the 40s and now is that we have these huge weapons of mass destruction pointed at every single major metropolitan city. And that should we have a big brained idiot decide to push that shiny red button, that's the end of the human species. The fact that this war is still ongoing. And it is involving a major global superpower and the United States and other global superpowers in the sidelines financing Ukraine. Um, this war does have the potential of escalating into something far more deadlier. Now, all this could have been avoided. Diplomacy could have taken place. Nobody needed to die. But people wanted to make a profit. And yes, it's the top one percenters that are playing this game. It isn't democracy versus oligarch tyranny versus freedom no it's oligarchs versus oligarchs who are making a huge financial killing in the blood of people and so when i hear the words of rfk jr or yes even donald trump saying they want to end this war sounds good sounds good on paper but there are far more vile people who come in many shapes and forms who are in key positions of power that view this war as their best financial portfolio it's a sad truth and when you have a media that doesn't even investigate into why there's a war there's a, there's a reason why again anyone who speaks outside the establishment or outside the establishment narrative including rfk jr which again the videos coming up once again convince me why i'm not voting democrat we need to Always be on alert about how our system is being run. That's why I say we need to build movements and organizations not connected to Washington, D.C., because the people in positions of power do not have our best interests at heart. And a third of the Russians were, uh, Russia was, was reduced to rubble. So of course, they don't want a, an enemy, um, an enemy military in charge of the Ukraine. And they've made that clear for since 1992, since the, they took the wall down and the one request they made, they said, you can put NATO troops in, in United Germany. We will withdraw 400,000 troops from United Germany. But do not make us a promise. You will not move NATO, NATO to the east. And we promise them, yeah, we won't move it one inch to the east. Well, we moved it a thousand miles to the east into 14 new countries. And now we've surrounded and encircled the Russians and we're treating them like the enemy. And, and of course, that's a self fulfilling prophecy. And then, you know, you know, Glenn, um, the, the, the clear evidence that the United States was involved in the 2014 coup. That removed uh, Viktor Yakanakovich's government, which is a you know a, a Russia a government Ukrainian government that was duly elected by the Ukrainian people, and that we regarded as too sympathetic to to the to the government of Russia, and so you know we we pumped five billion dollars 
into the project of overthrowing that government. Now, I do want to pull up another video, and here is where we see the back and forth between Glenn Greenwald and RFK Jr. about the decision to delete a tweet praising Roger Waters. Now, for those of you who do not know about Roger Waters and the current controversy surrounding him, there are many people that want to censor and silence Roger Waters due to him performing his show that he's been doing for 40 years, uh, The Wall. Um, again, there is a moment during that production where the main character of The Wall has a delusion where he is a quasi-fascist dictator. Now, the thing, it's satire. Key word, making fun, ridiculing fascism. Now, Roger Waters has been doing this show for 40 years. So for all these people that want to cancel and censor Roger Waters and saying that he's anti-Semitic, here, I'm actually going to look at the camera. For those people who are saying that Roger Waters is anti-Semitic and have been paying attention to the lyrics of what the wall is about, or perhaps you're unaware that he's been doing the show for 40 years, are you dumb, stupid, or dumb? Hell, maybe all of the above. I mean, are you paying attention to the lyrics of all the songs or what the production's all about? Do you need help understanding what art is, what music is? Because if you're mentally challenged and you don't know what the wall is, maybe take time out of your day, pour yourself a cup of tea, go on the interwebs, and do the research. You know, do some reading, because it'll help you know what you're talking about instead of trying to cancel Roger Waters or making this ridiculous false statement that he's anti-Semitic. He is not. He is not. Okay? He's anti-war. He's been consistent about that. But if uh, you can't understand that, then there's no help in you. So let's play this video. Uh, a recent controversy in which you found yourself more as a window to understand some of your broader views, which was the praise you originally offered for Roger Waters um, with regard to his stance on both Ukraine, which he is opposed to in terms of the U.S. proxy war, as well as COVID. He was questioning a lot of the same orthodoxies you were. And then you ended up deleting that tweet where you praised him and made clear that the reason was because he had held views on Israel and Palestine that you didn't share. I want to ask you about the specific kind of divergencies that you have with him on that question. But before I get into that, why was it necessary for you to delete your praise for Roger Waters just because you disagree with him on Israel? Can't you praise him on Ukraine and COVID and then at the same time say, but there are other issues, including Israel, where I Again, seems reasonable, Glenn. And this is where RFK Jr. and, yes, even voting or even participating in the Democratic primary is a fool's idea. This is where, again, I once again reinforced with my perspective of what I saw in 2016 and in 2020 why it's pointless to vote in the Democratic primary. Now, if you want to vote for Marianne Williamson and RFK Jr. in the Democratic primary, fine. I can respect that decision. I just hope that your candidate's willing to fight fight for the nomination. But then again, too, this is the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party has special interests, including the Israeli lobby. Like there's the military industrial complex and big oil and big pharma. You got to kiss the rings. All of them. I have differences. Why did you delete the praise entirely? Well, first of all, the reasons that I praised him uh, was because of his position on the war, the, his position on COVID, which I thought was very courageous at a time when nobody, and also his position on Julian Assange. Right. Uh, I, I disagree, um, I would say, fiercely with his criticism of Israel. And I. Criticism of Israel is not being anti Semitic. And I want to acknowledge someone in the live stream chat. Maria C. writes, he lost his dad in World War II fighting the Nazis. That's true. And plus, Roger Waters' father was a conscientious objector during the Second World War. That was a pretty big deal. You know, during that time, you could face jail time. And Roger Waters' father was also part of the first responders helping people who were being bombed during the Blitz. So all these people saying that Roger Waters is anti-Semitic 
Your proof is of him doing a show that he's been doing for 40 plus years, pretending to be a dictator. And then also his criticism of the Israeli government being critical of a government does not make you anti-Semitic. It doesn't. That's a lot of mental gymnastics that you're doing out there. People who are critical of Roger Waters and RFK Jr. Come on, buddy. There's a little bit of a stretch here. It's a little bit of a stretch here that you're doing and you're losing me. You haven't lost me completely, but you're losing me because I because I, I do respect him running in the Democratic primary, even though I think it's a fool's idea. I do respect him for doing this. However, once again, when you make statements like this, you convince me why it is pointless to even vote Democrat, even if you hear a Democratic candidate saying things that are very interesting and oh, oh, so wonderful. But then, oh, you're running in a Democratic primary. Waste of time. And plus, you're part of the Democratic establishment. So you already got special interests surrounding you. I'm not, you know, there are there are enough people who characterize those um, political differences anti-Semitic that me endorsing him uh, felt like I was buying into that, um, you know, into into something that was that, you know, was abhorrent to me. Real quick, someone else in the chat, Natalie Williams. I'm critical of my government, yet I'm not anti-American. RFK Jr., you've been also critical of our government and our politicians, too, and you're not anti-American, okay? Being critical of the Israeli government does not make you an anti-Semite. Being critical of a government's policies doesn't make you anti the people. It makes you critical of the elected officials running said government. RFK Jr. And we do invite you to be on the show. And yes, yes, we did send an invite out. We are on a list. We are on a list. Whether or not um, we get that interview. I mean, it's up in the air. It's up in the air. We're, I've been told I'm on a list. And it is what it is. I really disagree with his. I think Roger, like many critics of it, first of all, people who criticize Israeli policy should not be characterized as anti-Semitic. But people who apply a different standard to judging Israel than they would to judging an Arab country, um, I think then that you've crossed a line there. And I, I do think that Roger does that. You know, I've He's not crossing a line. He's calling out what the apartheid government is doing to the Palestinian people. I mean... Have you not been paying attention to what's happening in, in Palestine? I mean, hell, they don't even have running water. <laughs> running water? What is that? In the West Bank? In Gaza? What? I mean, come on. It, it is it is downright deplorable what is happening there. Now looked at some of his stuff, and I think, you know, I like I said, I do not think people who criticize that that people who criticize Israel policies should not be called anti-Semitic, but I do I do think that many people are applying, or Israel's critics are applying a double standard. So just to be clear, when, when you were interviewed by Crystal Ball on Breaking Points, it became kind of a very talked about interview, particularly the part where she was disagreeing with you about your view on vaccines. We did a segment on this show talking about that interview and my main critique with her, who she, and she's a friend of mine, was that, I didn't have a problem with her disagreeing with your views on vaccines. Lots of people do. She described it, though, as a red line, which seemed to me her way of saying, I don't just disagree, disagree with you here, but you're so far beyond the pale about an issue that I regard as so sacred that the fact that, you dis that I disagree with you here means you're basically off limits, like you're radioactive. You're not susceptible to consideration for support no matter what in a way that, say, Joe Biden wouldn't be. That's the impression I got when you didn't just disagree with water waters on Israel, but deleted the praise, namely doesn't matter how much I agree with him. I regard him as a person who's so radioactive that he should never be praised under any circumstances because of his view on Israel. That's a red line for me. Is that essentially what motivated your deletion and how you view people like Roger waters and those who share his views on Israel? Again, Glenn Greenwald is absolutely correct on this because look, look again, Roger waters. He's not a politician. He's not a tyrant. He's not a dictator. He's not a president or a prime minister or a king. He's an artist. He's a musician. And yes, 
everyone, including you, my audience, all of you have different perspectives and points of view. I'm friends with a lot of people across the political spectrum, be they libertarian, green, socialist, Democrat, Republican, no matter the color of skin or generation. None of us are going to think the same. And you know what? That 2016 election really taught me an important lesson. We cannot be closed minded and we cannot be in our own bubbles. And since then, it has gotten progressively worse. Now, I have been paying attention to when musicians or artists or directors or actors or actresses put art on display for the public to consume and look at. And it's also important to read and understand what the show is all about. The wall is not anti Semitic, the wall is about something else altogether. All right. I'm not going to waste anyone's time just going into detail of what the wall is. All right. It, the show has been going on for 40 years. It is inexcusable for people wanting to cancel Roger Waters. Again, again, I could rant all day, but let's listen to the rest of this. No, not at all. In fact, I, I, I continue to admire Roger Waters for his positions on. You know, for his courageous positions on the Ukraine, on Julian Assange, on COVID, but you know, uh, my because of the that issue is so sensitive and radioactive to people. I did not want to leave any any opportunity for people to misunderstand. Since apparently, I guess, as my understand it now, he's more well known for his anti-Israel position than probably any other position. And so me chain charged me praising him without making really clear what I was praising him for, and that I did not buy into his other stuff was a, a source of confusion to people that I did not want to leave up there. You could have just done an addendum tweet. You you could have just also mentioned something too, or you know, just do a video statement about why you support Roger Waters, okay? You know, there's a lot of libertarians who I speak to who believe in less government and deregulation, et cetera, be like, hey, look, I I may not agree with you, but you are still my friend. You know, I've I've been told by people since Hardlands Media started who to interview and who not to interview. I've been told by people, oh, you shouldn't interview libertarians. Oh, you shouldn't interview greens. You shouldn't interview this. You know, I, I had a couple of quote unquote activist people tell me how I should be doing my show, right? And they said, well, we don't want to be associated with you anymore. And when I've had those said activists on my show, you know, I got messages from other people saying, oh, you shouldn't interview them. See, the thing is, I'm going to run my show and what I have on this program the way I want, right? And it's up to people to make your own conclusion. But I've been very consistent here with Hard Lens Media. And what is that? I'm free speech, for giving a platform for people who want to speak their mind and introduce you themselves to you my audience i believe in third parties and independence i believe in citizen ballot initiatives i've been consistent about that folks consistency is key rfk jr fair enough i mean i think the reason why he's most known for that is sometimes the same reason you're most known for your views on vaccines even though you have views on lots of other things which is because a lot of times people look for ways to take establishment critics and kind of render them radioactive by focusing on the one issue they know people will be most hostile. Now, I want to pull up this one last video, because, again, there's the good and the bad. I will give um, RFK Jr. credit for this in regards towards his thoughts on Snowden and Assange. You know, when Snowden, when Snowden released, nobody in our country knew about that the intelligence agencies were mining all of our data and spying on americans members of congress no. didn't know i remember pe pe members of congress oh calling congress. me and saying tell me what's going on i have not the intelligence committee and i haven't heard this yeah and congress then went and acted on what he told them to change the rules oh how are you making this guy a criminal he's an american hero yeah i'm gonna pardon those guys you know up front i mean i'm gonna look at their cases assange I'm going to pardon on day one. I'm going to hold you to that, buddy. I'll hold you to that. Because consistency is key. Now, it's up in the air on what, how this Democratic primary is going to play out. Maybe we see RFK Jr. continue to uh, gain some momentum. 
let's face it, we live in a country where the two party system dictates on how voters, uh, who voters are going to vote for. Okay. Um, but like all people, RFK Jr., like anybody else, is flawed and has different perspectives and points of view. It is up to you, the voter, to decide how you're going to vote. Now, Hardlands Media, it's up to you guys, our viewing audience, how you want to vote, be it for any of the Republican candidates, any of the Democratic candidates, independent, third party. And if you don't want to vote, fine. But if you're not going to vote, I will ask one favor. If you live in a citizen ballot initiative state, Support the citizen ballot initiative, be it good or bad. Like, again, if it's bad, vote against it. If it's good, support it, and then walk out and give a middle finger in the air, and that's it. That's a favor I'll ask. You don't have to do it, but it'll be a favor to me. But nonetheless, nonetheless, um, I know in good conscience I cannot participate in the Democratic primary. I will not waste my vote for any Democratic or Republican candidate. I think what we need to see now for this election cycle is something different. It's time for independents and third party movements to take hold of this country and break the neoliberal nightmare that we're in. I can commend and tip my hat towards RFK Jr. for being correct on some issues. But again, when you run the Democratic primary or run in the Democratic Party or be associated with the Democratic Party, it's one big red flag. 